So we'll just begin with, uh, with some silence. Uh, I'll do a, a little bit of guiding. So just settling into our seats. And pausing, relaxing, opening, feeling the weight of the body. Taking a couple of deep breaths. Just breathing into that contact point between body and earth. Just resting with the body breathing. Noticing the expansion on the in-breath. Release and relax on the out-breath. Allowing the body to soften, the belly, the chest, allowing the shoulders to drop, the arms to relax against the sides, the hands to rest comfortably. Allowing the face to soften, the cheeks, round the eyes, the jaw. Noticing where there's ease, noticing where there's tension. where we can release the tension and just releasing it where we can't simply allowing it to be just as it is and just noticing what's present what's present internally maybe a little bit of a body scan Allowing the awareness to ride the wave of the in-breath.
and just fill the body with mindful awareness all the way up to the top of the head down to the feet and all the way out to the skin pausing relaxing opening and opening to the external the sound of this voice arising and passing other sounds simply noticing them allowing them to touch the awareness and pass nothing to hang on to And now opening to the internal and the external both. This body is sitting, breathing, feeling, hearing. Sounds arising and passing. Bodily sensations arising and passing thoughts arising and passing pausing relaxing opening allowing the eyes to open slowly in your own time first to the light then texture color and finally form 
and then allowing the eyes to lift. To notice the people in the room and on the screen. Or perhaps those people on the screen with their video turned off can, can turn it on so we can see their faces. Pausing, relaxing, opening. So welcome. So let's let's talk a little bit about inside dialogue. Um, particularly for those who this is their first experience. So inside dialogue is a meditation practice. It's based on the wisdom teachings of the Buddha. And it is relational. We're all familiar with sitting on a cushion with our eyes closed nobody speaking. But the Dharma is, is relational. The whole Dharma is relational. In the Upada Sutta, the Buddha um, refers to Kalyanamita, the noble friendship, as being the whole of the holy life. So this relationality is, is really important. Inside Dialogue came into being over a number of years, beginning in, I think, the late 80s, early 90s, and eventually became Inside Dialogue in around 98, 99, through the work of Gregory Kramer. And over the, the 25 years since, it has grown and grown and grown. So now we have communities all over the world, North America, Canada, Australia, Hong Kong, China, Sri Lanka, South Africa, South America. And people are drawn to this because it is a very powerful practice. We'll get to try a little bit later on. We have a, our practice session this evening. But when we are engaged with another person, when we are free to talk to them, then the mindfulness becomes really quite easy to maintain. When we're sitting on a cushion, it's so often difficult. Our minds get caught up on something and go round and round and round in circles. Mindfulness is very difficult to achieve. With the relational aspect, almost without exception, people find it really easy to be mindful for an extended period of time, even when you're first beginning. So in the practice of inside dialogue, we normally practice with one partner, sometimes with two, we have triads, sometimes in a larger group, but most often it's in, it's in a dyad. So the people online will be practicing in breakout rooms and the people here will be practicing face to face. Uh,
It's important to create a safe container for practice. So the precepts are really important. Virtue is really important. The Brahma Viharas are important. So building on that, on that safety allows us to release the need to protect ourselves. We can release our attachment to this self a little bit. And when that happens, a connection forms between partners, whether they're online or in person, that's quite remarkable. We can have quite deep connections with people we have never met before. We have six guidelines that you will be practicing with. So the first guideline is pause. So pause allows space for mindfulness to establish itself. It's just a momentary stop to whatever's happening in the mind, whatever's happening in the body. No fixed length. It can be a couple of breaths, can be a fraction of a second. It could be longer than that. When we pause, when we open to the presence of mindfulness, we investigate what's present, where we find tightness and tension, we can relax it, the second guideline. So that begins with the voluntary relaxation of, of the body, allowing the body to soften, the hands to unclench, shoulders to drop. So that's simple coming into the body. Where we find any tightness or tension, we can breathe into it. Where it doesn't release, where it doesn't relax, then simply allowing it to be just as it is. Again, just breathing into it. This is what's present in this moment. When the mindfulness starts to become established, where there is some ease, then naturally the attention opens to all of the sense gates. We can see, we can hear, we can feel, we can smell, we can taste, and and the mind does what mind does. The mind and the body aren't separate. So when we, when we start to settle, when that relaxation begins to settle in, the mind finds stability. So pause, relax, and open aware all the work is done. When we are in that really relaxed and open state, then we can notice the arising and the passing of phenomena, the breath entering and leaving the body, sounds arising and passing, thoughts coming and going, other bodily sensations coming and going. And this arising and the passing we call that guideline attuned to emergence. We're simply attuning to the flow of experience. So these first four guidelines 
can be done anywhere at any time. We don't need a partner. When we come to the fifth and sixth guideline, which are listen deeply and speak the truth, then we are relational. In listen deeply, we're listening with the whole body. We're listening with the ears to the words. We're listening to the tone of the voice, the sound of the voice, the musicality. All that information that's carried with the changes in pitch and tone of the voice. We're listening with the eyes. We're noticing body language, facial expression. And we listen at a deeper level than that, at a level where we are not conscious of what it is that's connecting us, that intuitive understanding. Speak the truth is not speaking some absolute truth. It's speaking what's present in this moment. And I much prefer to call it speak deeply. When we are mindful, when we are investigating what's present, when we are touching the truth of what's present, then there is a lot of body language, a lot of facial expression. And all this occurs long before the words form and are spoken. So the person who's listening deeply will have seconds, maybe many seconds, to listen when there hasn't a word been spoken. And when the word is spoken, all that communication comes together. And there is a deeper understanding, a deeper connection. So when you are in pairs, in the room or online, these guidelines will support you. And we have a few other rules which will also support us. So the first rule is no questions. This is not a conversation. Um, so we ask that you don't ask questions of your partner. You can ask them, you know, maybe for a pause, maybe to repeat what was said. But no questions about whatever the topic is. And we do this <clears throat> because we don't, we don't want people to get into story. When we get into story, then it becomes a conversation. We lose mindfulness very quickly. We become interested. Wow. And this person said that? Wow. Have you tried this? And the have you tried this brings us to the next rule, which is no advice. And when people are sharing their difficulties, there is a natural tendency, particularly for those who are in the business of offering advice, to offer advice. So he asks that you refrain. It allows a deeper investigation on both parts. The 
sometimes when we when we enter this deeply relaxed state then emotions can very easily arise we can touch difficult topics you know maybe there will be tears rubbing the eyes a little difficulty in speaking we're going to be talking about death this weekend so it's really easy to get into places where there is where there is grief where there is difficulty so again when you are in the practice in the dyad to refrain from offering words of comfort what is most supportive in these dyads and what is most supportive in life is the mindful presence the words don't often help especially when they are somebody trying to help when we are present with someone when we can touch their difficulty when we can become part of that then we don't need many words really allowing compassion to be present the karuna the mudita the friendliness the love just allowing them to be there creating this container of practice in which they are present so this evening we're just going to be practicing with simple mindfulness so we're not going to be touching death this evening we'll be touching death over the weekend so tomorrow morning so i'll just very briefly mention the topic now it was really nice to be to be down here last night with all the trick and treaters going around we were just walking on the street here you know we're in the mission district of of san francisco so a very large spanish community here so all the the skulls and the decorations and the skeletons are all there to be seen so there is a festive quality uh to death so we'll be talking about that again tomorrow and on Sunday but what I'd like to offer this evening is is some simple practice with the insight dialogue guidelines and for that you're going to need a partner and Noam will be pairing up those people online and the people here in the, in the hall will find their partners and if gnome practice is online are you going to practice online gnome no. no okay so mm, how many people we have online two four six seven So just a moment while we have a technical conversation here. So I think someone is going to end up practicing with me. But that's not a problem. Not for me. <laughs> so what you're going to be doing, you're going to be choosing 
who is going to speak first? We'll begin with five minutes, separate speaker, listener. And for those who are new to Inside Dialogue, this might be the first time in your life when you have spoken for five whole minutes without interruption. And conversely, the listener will have five minutes to listen, to listen deeply. And what you'll be sharing is, is simple bodily experience. Imagine sitting on a meditation cushion in a meditation hall. When you close your eyes, you choose your meditation object. Maybe do a body scan maybe rest with the breath and simply narrate your experience. This is what's present in this moment. It sounds very, very, very simple, but it's one of the, the deepest practices in Inside Dialogue, the one that's closest to being on a meditation cushion just feeling into the body, noticing the shoulders drop, feeling the weight of the body on the cushion. Feeling the body breathing. Noticing thoughts. Noticing some wondering if I'm doing this right. Noticing some coolness on the feet. So that simple noticing what's present, resting with it, allowing the words to form around it, noticing the words forming, coming up out of the chest being spoken. When you're speaking, you're also listening. Listener, listening to the words, noticing where they land in your body, noticing how facial expression, body language shapes your experience. Using the guideline, pause generously. taking a moment to breathe, to bring ease to any tightness that's present, to relax, where you can't relax, simply allowing. This is what's present in this moment. So we'll have five minutes separate speaker listener, and then we'll move into open dialogue. We'll have a little bit longer in open dialogue. Again, just staying with bodily experience. What's happening in the mind. But now taking turns to share. So one person will speak. Share just a few words. It doesn't have to be a story. It can be two or three words, a sentence maybe two sentences at most. Then allow a pause, a few breaths, time for the partner to notice what's present in their body-mind, again to allow the words to form, and the experience to be shared. So just going backwards and forwards. I'll be reminding you of this when I ring the bell between, between uh, speaker and listener, when I ring the bell to go into open dialogue, and when I ring the bell at the end. So I have been speaking a lot. Are there any questions? No.
we can, if you, if you look at the bottom of the breakout room list, there's a broadcast function. So if you, you can turn that on to voice and then they'll be able to hear the bell. Will you need to put the microphone to it? No, they'll be able to hear the bell from here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's too much for something. Will it be visible after I open it? It'll come on when, when you've set the breakouts room. I'll, okay. yeah. Okay. Yes, so there's pause. The pause is allowing that space for mindfulness, allowing space for investigation. Relax is releasing any tension, any tightness. Where we can't do that, then we simply allow things to be as they are. We just breathe into them. When, we, when that mind begins to settle with the pause and relax, then we can open, we can open to what's present. We can open to what's present internally. We can open to what's present externally and what's present internally and externally. So unlike on, on a cushion where we're doing very focused mindfulness, when we're trying to hold some meditation object, we, in inside dialogue, we do very open awareness. So whatever is arising. The arising and passing, we notice that, that's the attuning to emergence. So when the mind gets really settled, we get, you know, into a really strong mindfulness, there's samadhi then we can simply notice what's present when it comes, when it goes, and we simply share that. The listening deeply is listening with the whole body, the eyes, the ears, noticing what it, where words land in our body, noticing how it feels in our body. When somebody's speaking, you know, when somebody says, yeah, I've got a bit of a pain in my knee. Our awareness automatically goes to our own knee, noticing that. And um, speak, speaking the truth is speaking deeply. So really taking time to investigate what's present, allowing words to form. We're not trying to write a story, but simply allow the words to arise doesn't have to be a whole sentence. Yeah, coolness in the foot, itch on the nose, really simple. So those are the six guidelines. For this first practice, really to choose that first guideline, maybe a bit of the second guideline, really to allow that pause. So when we pause, like I say, we have the opportunity to investigate. We're not grabbing at a thought, grabbing at an experience. We don't get a prize for who can speak the most words. So I'm going to assume that you've chosen the first speaker. So first speaker, you now have five minutes to share present moment experience the body and the mind with your partner. And listener, you have five minutes to listen deeply, noticing where the words land in your body, noticing your experience of body language, facial expression, pausing and relaxing.
And so pausing, relaxing, opening, taking a couple of deep breaths, perhaps allowing the eyes to close. So now we're going to be changing roles. Speaker becomes listener, listener becomes speaker. And new speaker now has five minutes to share present moment experience with their partner, the new listener, who is listening deeply, listening with the whole body, noticing where the words land, noticing what's felt in the body, pausing and relaxing.
Now pausing, relaxing, opening, taking a couple of deep breaths, allowing the body to settle into the seat, maybe the eyes to close. Just releasing the words. So we're now going to drop the roles of separate speaker listener and move into open dialogue. Simply taking turns to share present moment experience. Really using the guideline pause to allow space for investigation of what is present. Pausing, relaxing, opening.
No pausing, relaxing, opening. So we're now coming to the end of our practice. So taking a minute just to offer gratitude to your partner for their sharing and support. And so we're coming to, to the end of our session. So perhaps I'll offer a short matter. So just finding a comfortable sitting position, feeling the weight of the body on the cushion. And before you close your eyes, just looking at the screen, looking around the room, looking at the presence of friends. What does that feel like? just offering gratitude for the support of everyone here. Offering gratitude for the support of all those who allow us to be here. Opening to all beings, wishing them ease and comfort, wishing them joy, And for all beings everywhere, may there be peace. May there be peace. May there be peace. So thank you all for your practice. Go well. Have a good night, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow morning. So death. We all face death, sooner or later. And in this, in this modern age, just as it was in the time of the Buddha. Death is one of those things we prefer to avoid at all costs, even to talk about it. So it's quite lovely to be down in San Francisco in the Mission District on the Day of the Dead and see death as a celebration, as a time for remembering. Remembering those that were close to us. And being present with death. So I'll tell you a little story about my own experience. So my wife Annie died about three years ago. And she had a medically assisted death coming from Canada. For those people who are in, in great suffering with no hope of relief are allowed to request a medically assisted death. And Annie had been ill for a long time, bedridden for 10 or 12 years. 
and in great pain. So she applied for a medically assisted death. And the moment that the request was granted, death wasn't present. She set a time two months down the road. She chose to die on the autumn equinox, which for her was a very important time. And then death disappeared. Annie was still in pain. But she had a lot more energy. And in those two months, we, we both went on a very profound journey. There was lots of joy. And he got the chance to give all her possessions away to people that she liked them, uh, wanted them to go to. We went through boxes and boxes of old photographs. Annie telling me the story around each photograph. And we'd set up envelopes so we could send, mail the, the photos back to friends. And Annie would look at a photograph, tell me the story, and then put it in the envelope. Or sometimes, quite often in fact, she'd tear the photograph up. The Annie was, uh, was very much a child of the 60s. And the friends were all now in their 70s and 80s and might not have appreciated being reminded, or at least their spouses and partners might not have appreciated being reminded. She got to talk to her friends she got to have her own memorial service. And all this time, there was no thought of death. The time and the date was set. No need to worry about it. No need to think about it. And on the on her last full day, she woke up early in the morning with no pain, lots of energy, and for the first time in months, I managed to get her downstairs and out onto the back deck. It was a beautiful autumn day and we spent the day out there talking, sharing stories, reading poetry. We had lunch out. And it wasn't until the late afternoon that Annie decided it was time to come back in. This was probably the first time in 10 years or more that she'd spent more than an hour or two outside. And she was still without pain. So we got her back upstairs and into bed. We had supper. And then Annie went to sit by the window to watch the full moon. We sat there for a few more hours until the moon passed out of sight. 
And as I was helping Annie back into bed, the telephone rang. And Annie said, I know who that will be. I'd like to answer it. So you go to bed. So I, I went to bed. And the next morning, Annie was still, still had no pain, not quite as much energy. So I had to rearrange Annie's room for the, for the doctor to come. And we were still, we were still full of joy. Annie was really supporting me. That care was, was mutual. That love was mutual. And around 2.30 in the afternoon, Annie died peacefully. There was still ease. There was still love. I'd been waiting for the connection to break between us. But there was never a sense that we were not in connection, even now, even here. I can still feel Annie. I have lots of Annie stories where she has shown up at various times in my travels and teaching. So that sense of loss was, was never present, except in a few moments when some memory would come up and then there'd be some grief. And then Annie would be back again and the grief would go. The Buddha is talking to a woman who has lost a child. And he says, your son arrived through one door, stayed a while and left through another. Why grieve? So what I'd like to offer on this weekend is the idea that we don't suddenly pop into this world, exist for a number of years, and then cease to exist. We are part of a process From the beginning of time, from the beginning of life on this planet, there has been a continuity. We arise out of that continuity. We are born. Our bodies are the results of two people coming together sperm and egg creating a child. We're born into this world. We are born into a culture, into a family. We're born with physical attributes. We take on aspects of our family, of our friends, of our teachers, 
over a lifetime, changing moment by moment, carrying those qualities with us, some not so useful, some very useful. And when we die, those qualities that we've shared with others will continue. And it changed me. As I share our journey, as I share this practice, you will be changed. And those changes will continue. Where the Buddha points us is towards the wholesome, towards wisdom. How to bring those wholesome qualities into the world, how to bring wisdom into the world. So we are part of that continuity, part of that flow. The Buddha died 2,600 years ago. And yet here we are, thousands of miles away from where he lived, sharing his teachings. And so we'll take a pause, just for a moment. Just allowing the words to be known and to be released. So I want to talk now a little bit about Inside Dialogue. So Inside Dialogue is a meditation practice. It's based on the wisdom teachings of the Buddha, and it is relational. If we go back into the teachings, we find that this sort of conversational practice, this talking practice, was in fact present in the Buddha's time. He taught this not with quite the same way that we teach inside dialogue. But conversations, relationality were very key parts of his teachings. In a sutta, the Anguttara Nikaya 9.1, he lists the conditions, the necessary conditions for awakening. And the first one is to find a friend. So that relationality is right up front. In another sutta, he says, Kalyanamita, that special friend, is the whole of this holy life. And the second condition for awakening is virtue. the precepts. Virtue allows us to be together in safety, in trusting each other. Virtue itself is relational. And the third condition for awakening is to talk to each other to hold conversations. Are these conversations about the Dharma, about what mindfulness, about what's present in this moment. And so this brings us back to Inside Dialogue. Now, Inside Dialogue was created in the, in the, mm, I guess, late eighties, through the 90s. 
So it began as an idea, not an idea around creating a dialogic practice, a creating inside dialogue, but in Gregory Kramer, noticing the power of talking to each other. He was doing a PhD with another person and they were looking at, at dialogue, its effect on, on relationship. And over 10 or so years, it became a meditation practice. And Gregory introduced it to the world, I guess, in the late 90s, 98, 99, as Insight Dialogue. And since that time, it has grown, the community has grown, and it's now all over the world. And Insight Dialogue is is based around these six guidelines. So the first guideline is pause. And pause is simply a momentary stop of thoughts or actions, allowing space for mindfulness to be established. It can be very short, it can be a fraction of a second. It can be minutes, it could be hours. So there's no, no time limit to it. It's simply that coming into the moment, pausing and noticing what's present, giving space for mindfulness to become established. When we are mindful of the body, mindful of the mind, then we will perhaps notice tightness, tension. We'll notice wanting. And the second guideline is pointing to the release of the wanting, release of the tightness, release of the tension. And the second guideline is relax. And where relax doesn't work, where there is still tightness, tension, wanting, simply allow. Allow whatever's present to be present. And just to rest with it. When we pause, when, <clears throat> when we pause and relax, then the mind settles, the body settles, and we can open to all the sen sense gates. <coughs> Excuse me. We can open to what we can see, what we can hear, what we can feel, what we can taste and smell, and open to the mind. So this pausing, relaxing, opening brings us into a, a state of consciousness where there is ease, where there is non-attachment. And when this happens, we can attune to the arising and passing of phenomena, sounds, feelings, thoughts, simply noticing the arising and passing. And we call this guideline attuned to emergence. It's attuning to the flow of experience, not grabbing onto anything, but simply allowing the experience to flow through us. So these first four guidelines can be practiced anywhere. We can practice them sitting on a cushion. We can practice them out in daily life when we're, we're not engaged with anybody in particular. 
And the fifth and sixth guidelines are where the relationality becomes explicit. So the fifth guideline is listen deeply. And listen deeply is listening with the whole body. Listening with the ears to the words, the meaning. Listening to the sound of the voice, the tone, the pitch, the musicality. The sound of the voice carries so much information. Listening with the eyes to the body language, facial expression. And listening at an even deeper level at that than that, some deeper connection. The last guideline we call speak the truth. And the truth being not some absolute truth, but simply what we notice is present in the moment. It might be a thought, a chain of thought. It might be a felt experience in the body. Something we see, hear, taste, smell. I like to, I prefer to call it listen deeply because it's in the mindful investigation of what is present, what can be shared. It's that listening deeply to our own experience that allows us to speak the truth. As we are doing this with a partner, our body language is changing. Our facial expressions are changing. Long before the words come out, long before the words form. And then we notice some experience that can be shared, allow the words to form around it, not scripting it, not considering what we say, but simply allowing the words to form, sentences to form, speech to happen. So the person who is speaking the truth is also listening deeply, is also pausing, relaxing, opening, attuning to emergence. So these are the six simple guidelines we'll be practicing with this weekend that will guide our practice. So this very first dyad is going to be on simple present moment experience. Imagine you're in a meditation hall, you've sat down on your cushion, You've allowed your eyes to close. And you're coming into mindfulness. You're perhaps doing a body scan. You're perhaps doing mindfulness of breathing. Whatever the practice, share it with your partner simply noticing what's present. So it might go something like this. Just noticing the body breathing. Feeling some coolness around my feet. Noticing thoughts. Noticing the mind getting caught up in a bit of story. Between each sharing, pause. Relax. Investigate. When something comes up that you can share, when there is some truth to be shared, 
sharing it in a few words. Could be just two words, three words. Could be one sentence. At most, two sentences. When you've shared one experience, again, pause. If you need help in the pause, just take a couple of breaths. Open to experience, and share the next experience. And listener, when you're listening, listening with the whole body, your eyes, your ears, noticing how it feels in your body, noticing perhaps when your partner shares coldness on the feet, that your awareness goes to your own feet. Sort of allowing that to happen, sharing the meditation, opening to connection. What we will be doing throughout uh, this weekend in these contemplations is we usually begin with five minutes separate speaker listener. So the speaker gets to share for five minutes. And the listener gets to listen for five minutes. And then we'll go into open dialogue where we simply take turns. And one person shares, pauses, and the other person shares and pauses. Very, very simple practice. This is perhaps the simplest practice we do, but it's also the deepest practice. This is where we establish this meditative quality that allows settling, that allows investigation. So for this, we need a partner. The, the Buddha's great awakening speaks to two forms of awareness. This being that is. So when there's a self, there's an object. And this speaks to subject-object awareness. When there is a subject, the subject's always referenced back to the self, a self. And the object, which is looked at in reference to that self. And the second form of awareness is this not being that is not. When there is no subject, there is no object. When there is no attachment to some fixed self, then the objects are not fixed. And this is an open awareness. And neuroscience discovered these two forms of awareness about 20 years ago, yeah, about 2,580 years after the Buddha. And we we use these two forms of attention all the time. Imagine trying to ride a bicycle or drive a car when you're dependent solely on subject-object awareness. I see a pedestrian or I see a traffic light. We couldn't do it. So we have to come into this open awareness. Naturally, we do. We notice things. Yeah, we see a pedestrian. We're driving along. If the pedestrian looks like it, you know, is going to move in front of the car, then we 
we take action, but otherwise it's simply a pedestrian. We see a traffic light. Oh, a traffic light. It's green. Don't need to do anything, just drive through it. When we walk out on a busy street, we don't bump into people all the time, but we're not constantly looking to avoid them. We simply move around them. Our open awareness allows that experience, and we simply just move. We weave between other people. We don't bump into people most of the time. If we are not mindful, then perhaps we do. If we're texting on our cell phones, for those who can text and walk at the same time, I'm not one of them. So these two forms of awareness are important. And the big difficulty that people encounter with open is when we say open to the internal and the external both. Because you think, oh, internals here, I can do that. Externals there, and you switch the awareness and you end up flipping backwards and forwards between them. Whereas if you simply come back into this open awareness, it's easy to be aware of internal and external both at the same time. You know, I can talk looking at Noam and I can experience Max in my peripheral vision and Chris who has just joined us in the chair over there. I don't have to look from one to the other to know that. I can feel that my feet are cool, that my butt on the cushion is quite warm. Those are all experiences that happen concurrently. So coming into this open awareness is really releasing our attachment to the self, to the subject. When we release attachment to that subject, then the objects will fall away naturally. You can't have a, an object floating in space without reference to a subject. So that construction doesn't happen. So in our practice this afternoon, what I'd like you to do is to play around with these two forms of awareness. Notice when subject object is present and notice noticing at the same time that you can still have open awareness. So for that we need partners. So just settling into our seats. So we'll do the most difficult thing first. We'll decide who is going to speak first. There we go. So hopefully we, we've all decided who is first speaker. And first speaker is going to be practicing pause, relax, and open. The pause and relax, they're, they're, they come as a set. We can't open unless we pause and relax. And we can't relax unless we pause. So what you're going to be opening to is an expanded version of present moment experience. You're going to be opening to the presence of your partner, opening to the room that you're sitting in. What do you notice? So simply opening to that open awareness without attaching to anything letting the eyes move around, letting the ears open to sound, 
letting the body open to felt experience, letting the mind do what mind does and being aware of it and sharing it with your partner. Noticing the weight of the body on the cushion. Noticing a little bit of fullness after lunch. Noticing the blue of the walls. Noticing my partner moving her head. Simple, simple, simple experiences. Pausing, relaxing, and opening. And listener, listening deeply, opening to the experience of hearing words, of hearing the sound of the voice, facial expressions, body language, open to the environment that you're sitting in, the room, the sounds coming in from outside, simply noticing. Are there any questions before I ring the bell and the first person gets to speak? Wonderful. Enjoy. And so just finding a comfortable sitting position. And just feeling the weight of the body on the cushion. Just opening to this body breathing. Allowing the shoulders to drop. The arms to rest comfortably by the side. The hands to relax. Allowing the body to soften. The belly, the chest. And 
softening around the face. Eyes, cheeks, around the jaw. Pausing any thoughts, any stories, allowing space for mindfulness to become established internally. Scanning the body, noticing where there's any tightness, any tension. And relaxing it where we can. And where we can't, allowing it to be just as it is. Allowing the awareness to write the in-breath, to fill the body. Relaxing, releasing on the out-breath. and allowing the awareness to move beyond the bounds of the body into the external, opening to sound. This voice arising and passing other sounds. Not looking for, not grabbing on to, simply noticing, touching them gently with the awareness.
an opening to the internal and the external both. This body is sitting, breathing, feeling, hearing, tasting, smelling, mind doing what mind does, pausing, relaxing, opening to the flow of experience, opening to the arising and to the passing, the arising and passing of sound, the arising and passing of the breath, and the arising and passing of bodily sensations, of thoughts, opening to the flow of experience. Pausing, relaxing, opening, very slowly, very gently opening the eyes, first to light, color, texture, and then to form. And allowing the heads to rise and just to 
look around the room. Noticing the people we're practicing with. Just feeling that contact. Pausing, relaxing, opening. So, good morning. Welcome. So, I, I just like to do a little bit of a recap. Uh, before we start this morning, we'll be dealing with the, we'll be offering the last two guidelines, Listen Deeply, deeply speak the truth this morning. But I'd like to touch in to, to the importance of pause, relax and open, and that attuning to emergence. Mindfulness is, is key to this practice, to sort of maintain that appropriate mindfulness as things change. One way of working with open and attuned to emergence is to have a mindfulness anchor, sort of your feet touching the floor or your butt on the cushion or the breath, whatever's easy for you. And to simply open to that, the presence to that experience. So right at the moment, I'm opening to my feet on the floor. I'm not grabbing onto it, I'm not trying to do it, I'm relaxing into it. So that relax, that touching something with ease, so I'm not trying to do it, allows that open awareness. I can talk and recall words and look around and still feel that experience of the, of the feet on the floor. So I'm opening around that experience. And when we're opening to internal, external, both, it's quite difficult when we're not used to it because we tend to flip between the two. The mind goes to the external and then goes whoops and then goes back to the internal. So having that anchor point that we can just touch very lightly the whole time. So all the time I've been talking, you know, my awareness is just touching the feet on the floor. It's simple. We're going to be working with listen deeply and speak the truth. And when we are listening deeply, we're listening with the whole body, with the eyes, the ears, felt experience. We don't want to be focusing on what the other person is saying. We have been taught throughout our entire lives to listen. I can remember it being a kid, you know, you know you listen, you know, you have to concentrate on your teacher. And that's a very, very bad way of listening. Um, it's so much easier to really hear what's being said when we have this open awareness. If we narrow the focus, if we start to grab onto words, I must remember that, then we distract from whatever comes next. When we're focusing on the words, we're missing the body language, the facial expression. 
And so often in life, the words and the body language, facial expression are diametrically opposed. You ask someone if they're okay. Oh yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. You listen to the words you hear, okay. And the facial expression, body language tells you exactly the opposite. So it's critically important when we're listening deeply to listen with that open awareness, to attune to the arising and passing of experience, how the words are landing, how the body language is landing, opening to that flow of experience, rather than picking out individual components of that. Oh, he looked really sad. He must be sad. And that pump, you know, we reframe everything around that one experience, which might have been fleeting. We might have misread, you know, a facial expression or, or body language or word. Yeah. We might have misheard. The person might have misspoken. So when we can open to the whole flow, the whole experience of listening, then we can, we can really start to connect with what is being said, what is being expressed. That relational connection deepens. We open to the experience. And, you know, some of you commented on that yesterday. In, in the listening, you know, we listen differently. When we're speaking, we speak out of experience. Whatever the topic is, whatever we're talking about, how is that being felt in the body? How is it being held in the mind? So even as we're, as we're speaking, we are listening, we are investigating. And again, that open awareness is, is critical. Um, it's so easy to go up into the head and get caught up in story. Yeah. We have this wonderful capacity to create story. And once the story gets going, there's no stopping it. <clears throat> we come up out of the body. We lose our connection with somebody we're speaking to. And we just fire this story at them. Yeah, this is a great story, blah, 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 blah it goes. When we're speaking deeply, when we're speaking the truth, we're also listening to the body language and the facial expression of the person we're speaking to. Again, just opening to it. Yeah. We can understand whether we are making a connection or whether it's just going past them. We can see reactivity. We can modify how we speak, how we share, so that we find that point of resonance between speaker and listener. So we speak into the space between us, rather than at the person we see sitting opposite. And so we will We'll begin with just a repetition of what we did yesterday, just to allow us to settle into practice and, you know, really allow that mind to settle. So we'll spend a short time doing that. And then we'll go into, into the listen deeply, speak the truth practice. And that is a little bit different 
than how we've been practicing so far. I will explain it at the time, so you don't need to remember this, but I just want to let you know so that you're not suddenly surprised by, by the change. So the speaker will speak for around seven minutes, and the speaker will be speaking on the topic, which I'll, I'll share when we get to it. And then after the seven minutes, oh, sorry, back up. The listener will be listening deeply, listening with the whole body. So simply opening to that flow, words, sound of the voice, body language, facial expression, just allowing it to flow through. And then after the speaker has shared, the listener will reflect back to the speaker what was heard, what was seen, not as an analysis of what was shared, but simply witnessing a witnessing of the act of speaking, the act of sharing. So commenting perhaps that, you know, when you said this, I saw your hand tighten. Before you shared this, your eyes were looking around. I could see your body move to the right. Your hands, you moved your hands. And then as you spoke, you made a gesture. So it's mirroring back what has been seen, what has been heard. Not when you said this, I felt my heart lurch. Yeah. So strictly a mirroring back to the, mm -hmm. to the speaker. And then after that, the speaker will have one minute just to reflect back to the listener, what it was like to hear their words, their body language mirrored back to them. Don't have to remember it, but that's what's coming. Um, yeah. So to practice, we need partners. Yeah, this is an exercise. This is primarily, no, it's an exercise in both listening and speaking mindfully and being fully present and being relational. So really coming into that container of practice and speaking and listening out of that container of the practice so that it's not, I am listening, you are speaking. It's we are listening and speaking. It probably won't apply today, but when, when we're practicing in life, and certainly when I'm practicing with, you know, Pauline, who I've practiced with now for 14 years, 13, 14 years, um, is we'll be talking about something. Um, you know, we both, when we have stuff in life that's causing us issues, we, you know, the first person we share it with is, is each other. Um, and when we're speaking and listening, we threaten to record it because it would make absolutely no sense whatsoever to anybody who was, you know, who knew what we were talking about. You know, um, you know, one of us will come up and, you know, express, you know, when I was, when Annie was dying, you know, Pauline was my go-to person. You know, and I'd say, well, okay, we're having a little bit of problem about, about this. And, you know, Pauline might say, yeah, I remember my father. Talk a little bit about her father. And, you know, <clears throat> I would say, yeah, the newspaper. And it's like, what does the newspaper have to do with, you know, the conversation. 
but is thinking of my father sitting at the kitchen table with the newspaper because he always used to fold the newspaper in a specific way. Uh, and Pauline would go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, there was no, you know, no flow, apparent flow to the conversation, but we knew what we were talking about. So to us, it made complete sense. And it might have nothing to do, nothing apparent to do with the original question, which would have been about, you know, something to do with Annie and looking after Annie until the very end when we go, yeah, I could do that for Annie. And nothing in the conversation would have referred directly to that particular experience. But the whole conversation would have been around felt experience. Yeah, you know, what was present, what was there. So when you're when you're sharing, you know, don't you don't have to make logical sense about this. You no, know, it's it's you know an insight is like is exactly like this. You know, it has nothing to do with what's happening in the moment, and it's like, boing, ah, it's there. Just comes totally out of the blue. So the practice is cultivating your ability to allow insights to arise. In the You're cultivating the, condi cultivating the conditions for insight to happen. Yeah. And the insight can be from something that's been floating around below the level of consciousness, you know, and in a moment it goes up to the surface and it's there. Yeah. Share with your partner. I mean, it's, I mean, share like that. Yeah. Yeah. I will have more insight in a two hour walk with Pauline than I've ever had on a, on a cushion, you know, cause it's pop, pop. Pop, pop, yeah. So we're going to begin with separate speaker listener. And this time the speaker will be choosing a story of your life with a happy ending in it. So it might be a difficult time that you went through. Yeah, you broke up a relationship. So there was a challenge around that, but then you found the love of your life or, you know, you were making a decision about what to do in school and really experiencing the, the, the struggle with that, the making the choice, and then you made your choice and it worked out wonderfully. You got, you know, a job you wanted, uh, you're like, you know, should I meditate or not? I don't want to meditate, you know, I, and then finding the Dharma and appreciating that. It doesn't matter what the story is, but it's nice to have that struggle and the release from the struggle. <clears throat> Coming into the story, pausing, what does it feel like? What did it feel like at the time? So that recollection of the of the struggle, the story around it, but what does it really feel like? Feeling the tightness, the tension around it, feeling the release when it ended, when, you know, now you're free from whatever it was, now something really nice happens. How did that feel? So it's that trajectory from difficulty, into ease. You will be sharing the story, 
But as you're sharing the story, really touching into the felt experience of the story. When you're sharing, when you're speaking, pausing, relaxing, opening, allowing your words to form, not getting caught up in the story, well, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, but taking it really slowly. Ah, now this, now this, now this. Now this, now this, now this. So you're, as you're speaking, you're listening deeply. You're speaking what is present. You're speaking the truth. And listener, this is really an exercise about listening deeply. The speaker is listening deeply to what the story is telling them, their experience of the story. And the listener is listening from a really mindful place, really opening to the flow of the story, not trying to grab onto words because you're going to be reflecting back to the speaker. But don't grab onto the words, ah, I must remember that, oh, I love that, you know. And then because you'll spend the rest of the, you know, time hanging on to that one little nugget that you want to share and missing all the rest. Okay, so yeah, notice those things. Oh yeah, that touched me. Let it go. Relaxing into that open awareness so that, you know, body language, facial expression are simply part of the flow. The words are the part of the flow. The eye movements, the sound of the voice, the gaps between the words are all part of that flow of experience that you're opening to. So that will be the beginning, the first part. And then the second part will pause, relax, open. And the listener will reflect back for the three minutes what was seen, what was heard, but it's a mirroring back of the experience. It's not how it was felt by you, but what you actually experienced, saw, heard, bringing things together. When you were thinking about this, I could see your eyes moving. You know, when you talked about how difficult it was, your face contracted, I could see sadness. That's very simple, mirroring back. And then we'll have one minute where the speaker will simply say, wow, did I do that? Or, yeah, that was, I recognize that. That's something that I do, I recognize that. So the first speaker, the first person to share will be the person who was first listener on the opening contemplation. So pausing, relaxing, opening, just taking a couple of deep breaths. If you can stop thinking about what you were going to, to share, allow the topic just simply to form. So, first speaker, you have seven minutes to share your story with your partner who is listening deeply. Just opening to the flow of experience. So pausing, relaxing, opening. So pausing, relaxing, opening, allowing the words to be in the past and taking a couple of deep breaths. So now the listener has three minutes to mirror back to the speaker what was heard what was seen. 
pausing, relaxing, opening, attuning to emergence and listening deeply. So three minutes isn't very long. So pausing, relaxing, opening. So now we have one minute for the speaker to reflect back to the listener what it was like to hear their words mirrored back to them. Pausing, relaxing, opening. So pausing, relaxing, opening. So one minute is even shorter than three minutes. <laughs> so just settling into the seat. Let's take a pause just to allow the words, the story to be in the past. To come back into present moment. Pausing, relaxing, opening. Allowing the mind to touch the silence. So now changing roles. The listener becomes the speaker. The speaker becomes the listener. So new speaker, you have seven minutes to listen deeply and to tell your story. And listener, you have seven minutes to listen deeply, to listen with the whole body, the ears, the eyes, the felt experience. Pausing, relaxing, opening. Pausing, relaxing, opening. Just taking a couple of deep breaths, allowing the words to be in the past. So now it's the turn of the listener to mirror back to the speaker what was seen, what was heard. Really pausing and relaxing into the mirroring back, allowing the experiences to emerge, not trying to create a story out of them. Pausing, relaxing, opening. Pausing, relaxing, opening. Just taking a deep breath. So now the speaker has one minute to reflect back to the listener what it was like to hear their words, their gestures mirrored back to them. Pausing, relaxing, opening.
No pausing, relaxing, opening. Just allowing the words to be in the past. So we're now going to be moving into, into open dialogue. Just reflecting on the experience of speaking deeply, speaking the truth, and listening deeply. And I'd like in this, in this last 15 minutes or so to come back to our theme of, of death. The stories that we have shared have been in the past. Relationships that we may have touched have changed. So in each of our stories, there has been that aspect of passing through something, of leaving something behind. So we have left something behind that was difficult. We have moved from that into something that was not difficult, that may have had joy, may still have joy with it. But we're still in this passage, in this journey. Each story represents in some way a death of an experience, a death of a relationship. So really reflecting again on this experience of life as a journey. Things come, things go. Relationships are born, relationships die, relationships are reborn. So pausing, relaxing, opening. Sep no separate speaker listener, just in open dialogue. So pausing, relaxing, opening. So just taking a minute to offer gratitude to your partner for your for the sharing and support and then coming back into the circle. If we reflect on how we usually tell stories, we're usually telling a story with another story behind. I am telling you this story because, you know, I want you to like me or I want you to think how smart I am because I do this. And when we listen to our own story and not this sort of subtext that we're working from, then, you know, there's a much deeper connection with the story that we are telling. And so it's like we're hearing it for ourselves. So we're, we have that sort of separation from the story. So we're really telling it to two people. You know, we're telling it to ourselves, and we're telling it to our partner. Yeah. So I had a little insight earlier uh, with something you said. Um, and then I just lost it. Uh, this is this form of dialogue. Uh, it's it's very specific, you know. It's not just listening. It's not just listening closely. Um, and that it's been for me this wonderful opportunity to just sit with myself and sit with my story. And that I think we need more opportunities like this. I think more people need to spend more time just sitting with themselves and their story. Yeah. 
Describing it to be in space, I did without an anchor. So I, I, it's nice. It's gotten nice over the last few years, where I've been times in the day where I just have the experience of being open and awareness, and the circumstances in which that happens have broadened quite a bit. It just happens to be very nice bodies relatively very clean hands sitting on a cushion, looking out a nice window, and now I'm kind of left all kinds of places. Not so much at the end of a run. So it was interesting to do it because I slipped into that space a bunch with you. And I, I don't know if you guys need to do it with him, but you should try and <laughs> see if we'll do it because it's um there's some transmission I think of it, at least with at the very least your skill level, but I to me I feel like there's a good transmission because I was in that space while we we're talking quite a bit. At one point I said to you, it's like the background, so if I get deep enough on presence. Of space, right? Like things that should be straight will bend, and um, that happened all the time, more than once. Um, it's not what I'm in pursuit of, but it happened, and it was just uh, cool to go there. Like, I, I, there have been times when I've had that abrupting conversation. I had this conversation with my dad that was the strangest thing in the world, where I was just like, "Oof, everything is really here right now," and I was relating. So around the house, like me and my girlfriend will have these moments that we're up, and she's like right in the middle of funny, where we'll just like look at each other, and then we'll just be like, she'll make a face, and I'll make a face, but it's kind of um, not contrived. It's very, it's like a, at least on my end, I'm just sort of doing what spontaneously erupts, and it just has the same thing. But she and I are trying to work out a relationship where we have this kind of depth. We're trying some other kinds of structured dialogue. Uh, this one's pretty cool, though. Like, I think this has a, a little bit a lot of soul to it. So, I don't know. There's no, I don't have a clean finish. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Just no one. <laughs> Buddha <position>. well, <laughs> That's what he taught me. You don't have to make sense. <laughs> um, what do you say? <laughs> Just quickly, I, the uh, it was it was hard to hear the reflection about what I was doing when I was talking. That was hard to hear, uh, and some of that had to do with like the like awareness of self as as I was talking. visual conversation where I, yeah, I'm feeling uncomfortable and so I'm just like not making eye contact and like you know yeah it was hard to sort of even though I was dimly aware of it it was hard to hear that um, and then yeah the other thing is the, whatever you, you were just saying about um, like the met the meta story or the, the subtext, that is what, that's what is, that is what I'm aware of. It's like, as I'm telling somebody something, as I was telling you, how is she gonna respond? Does this make sense? Is this an important detail? Like that is like right there informing what is coming out. Mm -hmm. um, or the times when I remember to be like, feeling into uh, this was really hard and slowing down a bit or that bit I'm trying to like touch that note emotionally of like and this was like a triumphant moment or a moment of of, uh, of relief so uh, yeah thank you that was, that was good 
you know, the, you know, when you have those difficulties, then notice where the self is. There's an attachment to this self. When we're, when we're telling a story and we have this other story, this meta story going on, there is a self that is telling that story. Um, to be able to notice that is kind of the first hurdle. And then the second hurdle is, okay, just relaxing with it. This is what's happening. And when we relax with that other storyteller that's sitting on your shoulder, then we lose attachment to it. So then it becomes much easier to allow that flow of connection. And it becomes a transmission rather than a telling a, a story. So I'd like to talk about a couple of things this afternoon. We'll have some, some practice uh, and then some time for closing. So I'd like to begin with this concept of non-attachment. Um, when we think of non-attachment in a relationship, it's kind of, whoa, you know, how can I be non-attached, not attached to someone that I love? So there's something very counterintuitive in play here. And to understand non-attachment we have to look at what we are attached and non-attached to. So this is this concept of, of self. So we, we translate anatta as non-self. But our concept of self is somewhat different than, um, than the word implies in Pali. So the Atta is, originally really the translation was soul, but because it was being translated by Victorian classicists who were all very uh, strongly Christian, the idea of sort of putting soul into, into Buddhism was like, oh, we can't do that. But what it really is, is non-attachment to a fixed self. So in one way of looking at it is to look at our attachment to some role. Um, it's interesting because Sankara, you know, the formations, choices, however you want to translate it, one of the translations or one of the places it was used was in theatrical makeup. So, you know, you would have temple dancers and they would use makeup to, you know, disguise themselves and that was Sankara which I think is a really appropriate translation for Sankara. And so we put on these, these roles, you know, I am a, whatever it is, um, you know, our, our role in life, our profession, you know, 
I am a teacher. Uh, I am you know, in construction. You know, I, yeah, I know the stuff. You know, I am looking after people who are dying. You know, that's my my role, and it becomes a fixed role. It's a role that we can touch. We are familiar with it. You know, we can put on the costume and the makeup so easily. And we become attached to these roles. They become a habit. You know, we end up in a situation, I am, comes up. So we're releasing our, ta our attachment to that fixed role, not to the self it's itself, pardon the pun. Um, we always have this experience of a self. But the self can be fluid when we're at ease with someone, when we're, you know, we're not attached to being any particular way, we're in comfort, then that self will shift and change and we can see it, you know, just changing. You know, something happens and, you know, it requires a different self to be comfortably with that situation. No big deal. Again, it's something we do all the time, but we don't notice it. So we're not trying to get into some altered state around this non-attachment to, to quotes, the self. We're, we're really releasing that fixed relationship between ourselves and the object that that, you know, that in that subject object relationship. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, uh, inorganic object or whether it's a person. So it's how we are with that. Yeah. You know? If someone comes and takes my cup of tea away now and goes washing it up, I have no attachment to it. It's supported because it's gone cold, so I'm not really interested in it anyway. If I had just put it down there, so I've got a nice warm cup of tea there, and somebody took it away, it's like, whoa, where are you going with that? Uh, that's my cup of tea. Um, so releasing that attachment, that fixed relationship, and we can feel that relationship. Yeah. It's really easy to feel when we're attached to something. You know, it just takes somebody to you know, give it a little tug and it's, you tug back, there's that gripping onto it. And the gripping happens, you know, my nice warm cup of tea sat there, I don't have any attachment. I can't feel any gripping, you know, cl clinging to my nice warm cup of tea. You come and try to take it away from me. And that's when the, the contraction, the constriction happens. When we are in a very intimate relationship with somebody, that non-attachment allows us to really establish an incredibly intimate connection because we flow together with the experience. So you'll find this in the inside dialogue practice when you hit that point of resonance requires no effort. You can just stay there and follow each other quite comfortably. When we're in when we're with people who are sick or dying, and particularly on this weekend with people who are, who are dying, then that ability not to be attached is really important. Which brings me to the second thing I'd like to talk about, which is the caring relationship. In common usage, if we're with somebody who's sick or dying, we become the caregiver. 
and caregiver implies a fixed relationship. You are dying. I am looking after you. I am the caregiver. I'm a compassionate caregiver who loves you and will do anything for you, but we should do this. And what happens in that relationship is that the, the dying person, the sick, sick person, loses agency. And the caregiver, the person who's adopted that role of caregiver, takes on all the responsibility and suffering for the person who's sick or dying. And so the caregiver becomes burned out. Yeah. The sick person you know, has no respite, has lost all agency. Um, and it's a lose-lose situation. With Annie, I was never the caregiver. I was certainly never the caregiver for very long because you know, as soon as I tried to be the caregiver, you know, Annie would sort of i made my own choices, you know, you, you know, so very, very quickly I learned that, that, you know, that relationship was one of caring. So accepting support from the person who is dying or sick and, you know, really being open to what that person wants in any particular moment. And when somebody is dying, you know, they can change in a moment. You know, so often with Annie, she would, you know, ask for something. You know, maybe, you know, I'd like to have this for supper. And I would go off and make whatever it was, and then I'd bring it back, and she wouldn't be able to eat it. Um, and if I'd been attached to doing that and trying to force her to eat it or getting upset because she couldn't eat it, I, you know, I'd have burned out in, in the first couple of months. But in that caring relationship, when there was no attachment to any particular role, the being together was easy. We spent the whole of COVID, you know, totally isolated from the outside world. Um, so we didn't, I mean, we talked to people over the phone or on Zoom, but we never had anybody in the house. And it was wonderful. I mean, COVID for us was just, you know, it was perfect. Yeah, we didn't have to deal with anybody. Um, yeah, so there was no stress. So part of the reason for me doing this traveling and teaching this is, you know, like I've shared before, Annie said, you will go out and teach this. Because so many of our friends, you know, were all kind of the same age so there's a lot of sickness and difficulty floating around and so many couples were getting burned out by having to look after you know somebody who's you know starting to slip into dementia or or, or you know other illnesses um, whereas we were sort of breezing along quite happily and so that caring relationship requires that non-attachment to self, that non-attachment to things being the way I think they should be. Um, whenever I was, you know, uh, with Annie, you know, I might notice her having a struggle trying to find, you know, a comfortable, you know, trying to get comfortable. And mostly I would let her find her own way. And if I noticed she was struggling with something, 
I might say, can I help you get that pillow or, you know, would you like me to get this at most? And you know, sometimes she'd say, oh, yeah, it would be useful. And quite often she would say, no, I don't need that. Fine. Yeah. And that was OK. So there was no attachment to that. So what I'd like to do in this in this practice this afternoon, and this is really sort of wrapping up the all the practices that we've done and all the guidelines is to investigate this this caring relationship. One more thing in there, and I'd like to bring in, are the Brahma Viharas. So the Brahma Vihara, Brahma Vihara is the heavenly abode. Um, we usually pluralize it and call it Brahma Viharas, plural. But it's, it's actually singular, so it's a Brahma Vihara, the heavenly realm, the heavenly abode. And the way I like to look at it is a uh, vihara is a is a place a building. Um, I like to look at it as a building with four windows. So we have you know metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. You know love, friendliness, compassion, joy, shared joy, and equanimity. So we can move from one to the other so easily. And for me, it's a place to be in. So there is no subject or object in a Brahma Vihara. It's simply being in a place of love, a place of compassion, a place of joy, a place of equanimity. So often it's taught as something that we radiate, I radiate love, I radiate compassion. The practice is really developing that quality in our self, being able to touch it, because it changes how we are. When we are in a place of friendliness, then we are friendly to the people that we're with. Compassion, the same. We're we, it changes who we are and how we are with that, that person that we're with. So we're not trying to radiate that quality of, we are allowing ourselves to change, to come into a balanced relationship with the people, person that we're, we're with. And this can happen in the diet relationship and inside dialogue, and it can happen, you know, when you're out in life dealing with somebody who's sick or dying. 